Welcome to the Rebel Health Coach Podcast with Tom Underwood. Armed with truth and knowledge, your journey to a healthy lifestyle can be obtained. Preventative wellness, quality nourishment, and daily fitness routines dramatically improve your outlook on life as a whole. And you'll find the support and info you need to accomplish a healthier lifestyle here. Together, we can empower each other along our journey to an amazing you. Welcome to the Rebel Health Coach Podcast and happy February. Do you ever find yourself asking, why am I so exhausted all the time? In today's episode with Dr. Selassie, we are going to dive into chronic fatigue syndrome. People with chronic fatigue syndrome or CFS and chronic fatigue often hear that they are liars, lazy, disillusional, and or crazy. It's an illness that affects women in disproportionately large numbers. It is so disheartening to feel unwell and hear from practitioners, friends, and family that there's nothing wrong with you. Dr. Selassie received her naturopathic doctor degree from Basler University. Dr. Selassie is known as a doctor you can talk to. Her practice is centered on helping people be their healthiest best to live their life's purpose. Her patients have gotten help with conditions such as acne and eczema, thyroid disorder, autoimmune disease, and fibroids. She is a member of the Medical Review Board for the School of Applied Functional Medicine, which is where I went to school, and a proud co-founder of NatMed Coach. Dr. Selassie lives with her husband and five daughters in Brooklyn, New York. She loves journaling and reading books from personal growth and development to mindset to business and marketing, and of course, health. Enjoy today's episode. Dr. Selassie, welcome to the Rebel Health Coach podcast today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you today. Before we dive into today's show on chronic fatigue and chronic fatigue syndrome, or CFS, Tell the listeners about yourself and what stirred you into this path of naturopathic medicine. Okay, great. Um, so naturopathic, my, I'm the daughter of, of a medical doctor and a nurse. You know, my parents come from a very traditional background. They're from the Philippines. And in the Philippines, they have a great educational system and they can basically make a lot of medical doctors which they did, and nurses, but there's not many institutions in the Philippines to put these doctors to work. And so um, at the time, this was like in the 60s, they needed medical doctors in America. And so that's basically why they came here. And I was basically born into that. And I had eczema as a child and spent a lot of my childhood itching. And, you know, my dad being coming here because of medicine knew a lot of medical doctors and would take me to every renowned, you know, dermatologist, medical doctor that he would know. And so I spent a lot of my time drive with my dad and mom driving to the doctors, getting poked at and scraped and having them look at my skin and give me a steroid or an anti-itch cream or an anti-fungal cream or an antibiotic and not really getting resolution with my skin issues and just being itchy all the time. And then when I was probably in sixth grade, I think it started to impact me socially. And, um, you know, my dad would always be like, oh, do you want to be a doctor when you grow up? And I would be like, no. (laughs) Um, And then when I was was 14, my father was diagnosed with a really aggressive form of colon cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was his 20th year medical school reunion. So this was like in 1987. He graduated in 1967. And we went to the reunion and, you know, I was 14 at the time. And I think at that moment, at that reunion, I really realized that I have a cool dad, you know, like when you're like a preteen teenager, like your parents aren't cool. Right. But anyway, I realized he was really cool, but at the, that was the same time that he was also diagnosed with the 
colon cancer and it was very aggressive. And so he died 67 days later after oh, the wow. year reunion. And my mom said to me, you know, the funeral is going to be packed because there are going to be so many of these medical doctors that are in shock and they're going to be flying in from all over the country and even some from the Philippines and just like be prepared. And it was a huge funeral. I mean, the police were there directing traffic in the town. And I know that my dad um, was one of the physicians for the Baltimore police. Um, But when we got there, indeed, all of his friends were there, but the funeral was really full of his patients. And his patients were saying stuff to my mom, my brother and I, like, your dad made us feel really good. Like, your dad's sense of humor kept me coming back to all my doctor's visits. Or, you know, my mother had Alzheimer's, but she remembered your dad. And I started to understand that medicine wasn't just poking and prodding and giving drugs. It was actually, there was this part of my dad that was a healer. And that was the part that I really admired. And then fast forward, I did get a cure for my eczema. I, with the help of naturopathic medicine and things like diet changes and herbs and supplements and probably a bunch of experimentation and seeing naturopathic doctors and then also realizing, wait, you know, I can I can be a doctor and a healer like my father, but through the avenue of naturopathic medicine. And so here I am, and that's basically my story. That's great. That's a great story. Yeah. And uh, so I get to bring the best of of my dad and and you know, leave out the parts that didn't resonate with me. Right. Right. That's good. That's really good. You're also yeah. known as you're also known by your patients as the doctor you can talk to. Yeah. So, you know, when you when you first start in practice and you take these business classes, they're like, oh, what is your tagline? You know, like, you know, like Geico is whatever <laughs> call in 15 minutes or whatever, and you could take, you know, and they and so like I was toying around with a bunch of these taglines and probably just like every naturopathic doctor out there, I was like, I think my tagline was something like vibrant health naturally, you know, like optimal health, you know, natural <laughs> optimal health for you, you know, and that that worked for a while, but it didn't really distinguish me as, as anything separate from my other naturopathic colleagues. You know, I do still promote, of course, vibrant health or optimal health naturally. But then I had this experience where I think somebody said that to me, you know, oh, Dr. Slossy, you're a doctor I can talk to. And then another person said it. And then another person said it. And then I said, I think that that must be my tagline. There you go. And, you know, at the time my brother was was uh, designing my business cards and he he had a good laugh over it. But I honestly think it's true. <laughs> so it's it, good. I enjoy just, it. Yeah, great. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. And I like to I like to think about that. I mean, I you know, I think it's important to me that patients feel like they can talk to me. Um, I think that I'm a good listener, actually, and we've learned we learn about listening in school. You know, we actually learn it as a skill, and I like to make patients feel really comfortable because I think that that's really important in the in the healing relationship. You know, they have to be really comfortable. They have to be able to be really honest, and I need to be able to hold them in total positive regard, and they need to not feel like they're being judged so we can really say, well, what's going on and, you know, what's happening in your life. And I do use a lot of, I would say that counseling is definitely part of my practice and that there's a lot of, you know, it's, your body is, is intrinsically connected to your emotions and your mental state. And I think that there's so much to be said just from hearing a person's story. And some people have these incredible stories, but no one's ever really listened to it. So uh, that is very part of, very much a part of my practice. I feel like everybody has a story to tell. I'm certainly always enthralled by people's stories. And I think that sometimes just speaking their story, they can be healed. Right. So it is a big 
So a doctor you can talk to does really embody, I think, uh, my practice. I mean, you know, us naturopaths, we can be a little different from each other. Like <laughs> I have a colleague and he he does a lot of physical medicine. He does chiro, he does he does manipulations similar to a chiropractor. He does hydrotherapy and he doesn't do much talking, you know, and, and he is an excellent healer. He's just different than me, you know. That's amazing. So, yeah. We all have the same education, but when we come out, we're not necessarily the same, you know. Yeah, that's a great story. You also are the host of a radio show also, correct? Talk show. Yes, I for about eight years, I hosted Invite Health Radio, uh, which is Invite Health is a supplement company in the New York, uh, New Jersey area. There's also a store in Florida. Very good quality supplements. Um, it gave me a really good opportunity to talk about several different, you know, different different ailments and diseases that people are dealing with. It was a call-in you know? show? No, it was okay. on uh, regular national syndicated radio. Oh, it was nice. broadcasted in New York, Cleveland, Ohio, Atlanta, Georgia, Miami, Florida, Boca Raton, Florida, and Connecticut. Oh, nice. Yeah. It was Are you really used to this? Yeah, so I'm used to this. <laughs> and I like this. <laughs> All right, let's get into chronic. Let's get into chronic fatigue syndrome. Or chronic fatigue. How psychological is chronic fatigue? And why are women more likely to be diagnosed with it? So I don't think, even though, you know, I, even though you heard me say that the body has, has a, is intrinsically connected to the mind and the emotions, I mean that about all disease. And okay. I, I have to say that with chronic fatigue syndrome, it's a real thing. It's people are really feeling fatigued. There might be some psycho emotional connection to it, but it's never in anybody's mind when they're feeling chronically fatigued. Um, it's not like they think they're, you know, it's not like they really think they're fatigued, but they're really not. I mean, when someone has chronic fatigue syndrome, they are exhausted. There might be, like I said, there might be some kind of psychosocial connection, like how. Um, I don't know, lung, lung stuff might be associated with grief or colon stuff might be associated with anger or skin stuff might be associated with like a boundary issue. But when you say that, uh, when you ask how, you know, how psychological right. is chronic fatigue syndrome, I never would want anyone to think that it's in anybody's mind. You know, when someone is, has chronic fatigue syndrome, they are really feeling exhausted. Okay. If they can't come out of bed. Why is it mostly women? Uh, I do think that there is some kind of hormonal component to it. You know, there, there's a lot we don't know. And in fact, chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, which often goes hand in hand with chronic fatigue syndrome, is can be a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning they've checked out everything else. It's not any of the other things it could possibly be. So they say, oh, you have chronic fatigue syndrome. And so chronic fatigue syndrome can actually be caused by multiple things. Like I heard, I think I have it right here, that somebody had, um, is it called an acronym for the treatment of it? They said, or the finding the cause, they, they said it's shine. And I think S stands for sleep, H for hormones and hypotension, I is for infections. N is for nutrition and E is for exercise. So you really have to look at all those aspects when trying to figure out the root cause or the resolution for chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay. Because like in fiber, you said something, fiber, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome are often hand in hand or... or yeah, oftentimes... Okay. They're diagnosed hand in hand, not necessarily, but basically both of them are diagnoses of, of exclusion, meaning they've okay. excluded every other choice. And sometimes people have both. So chronic fatigue syndrome, the patient is extremely fatigued. They can't get out of bed. And fibromyalgia, you have there's 17 points of pain on the body, mm -hmm. and they might have at least 
I believe at least five to seven. You'd have to double check, fact check okay. me on my definition. But if you push on all those 17 points, they would have significant pain in each of those areas. And they often go hand in hand. And they often, you know, it's interesting with chronic fatigue syndrome. I mean, they're both definitely associated with sleep. Okay. With fibromyalgia, you have a difficult time getting a good night's sleep. With chronic fatigue, you might sleep too often or too much or need that sleep and not wake up feeling unrefreshed. You know? Okay. Now, where does Epstein-Barr fit into this puzzle? So Epstein-Barr is often associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. It's like a sequelae that happens uh, after being diagnosed or where some people don't even get diagnosed. They just have chronic fatigue syndrome. And then if they run a lab test, then they find that they they were positive for an Epstein Barr virus. Okay. You know, but so when you're looking at Shine, the comprehensive protocol addressing sleep, hormones, hypotension, infections, nutrition, and exercise, the infection is really, I think, what they're referring to as Epstein Barr virus. Okay. Okay. So let's give me a definition of what is chronic fatigue syndrome. So. Chronic fatigue syndrome is when that patient, they, they literally feel so fatigued that they just cannot get out of bed. They're also dealing with symptoms where they're feeling brain fog. They, they can't quite, they have a mental fatigue too. Okay. Um, and no matter how much they sleep, which could be often and a lot, they're not, their energy is not being refreshed. So, um, I, I hear lots of patients talk about it as if they, they are walking through, a, you know, they feel like they're walking through mud or pudding or there's like, you know, their, their head is full of mud. Like it's just this situation where they can't get any energy. They just feel very bad. Um, they can't do their activities of daily living, which, you know, like, they can't function at work. Um, there's no known cause. I mean, no, you know, it's it can be multifactorial. And as you said, Epstein-Barr can be one of the factors involved. Sometimes there's depression, you know, but who wouldn't who wouldn't be depressed, right? Right. Um, sometimes there there can even be a fever and so that's why I think that it, there is definitely an association with infection. And some people get chronic fatigue, fatigue syndrome even after some kind of other infection, like other viral infections, so not just Epstein-Barr syndrome. And there's there, like fibromyalgia, as I mentioned before, can be associated with it. But even if not fibromyalgia, which is, again, what I said is you're feeling pain on certain points. Um, there is an aching feeling that accompany that accompanies chronic fatigue, fatigue syndrome. So it's a, is it like a flu-like symptom? Flu-like symptoms? Then I think that that's a good way to describe it because a person can feel feverish and they can feel achy, but chronic is is going to be longer than a flu. You know, right. well, flus can be long. I mean, you can have a flu for anywhere from like two to fourteen days. But I think that when it really gets labeled chronic fatigue syndrome is they've had a flu or an Epstein bar or something, but now we're going on two months, you know, three months, and it's now become a chronic situation where maybe the fever is gone and maybe the aches and pains that you had with the flu are gone or more severe. But what's left is this terrible feeling of fatigue. Okay. What are some of the lifestyle factors that could? that attribute to chronic fatigue syndrome? So I think stress is huge. I think okay. that what I what I often find, like most of the women that I've seen in my practice with chronic fatigue syndrome and the men, because I've seen a few men, right. there is some kind of stress involved in their life. There is a stress factor in their life. They they're either had been chronically stressed or they had a traumatic situation that caused a lot of stress. Um, there is usually, uh, a, a, I, 
I believe there's usually a, a diet um, digestion issue with fibromyalgia. Uh-huh. Um, it's usually, like I said, multi, multifactorial. Um, I think exercise needs to be very much a part of the healing process, though exercise can be really tough because it's they're that exhausted. Right. So it has to be like a real restorative type of exercise, like stretching or restorative yoga or a slow, gentle walk in a park, you know? Okay. Just move your body. Yeah, move your body. And sometimes I think I find that some people with chronic fatigue come from a place. Well, you know, that's not true. I could say that I've had both patients that have come from a place of either one, having a sedentary life or two, being a very good exerciser, like the disciplined exerciser who somebody who exercises, you know, five to six days a week. And then all of a sudden they can't move. So I don't know if that's what the what the connection is there or why that is, but I'd have to say that gentle restorative exercise has to be part of the protocol for healing. Okay, I mean, so we're hitting on big two, you know, high stress levels and the the gut. I mean, the big two that cause disease. You know, yeah, stress and the gut. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that that could be the cause of multi uh, health issues that people have, but with, but it's definitely, it definitely plays a part in chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay. So is there any particular lab markers you look for when you're, you know, seeing somebody with chronic fatigue syndrome? So, you know, you might, you might actually be able to help me out with this one more, Tom, because honestly, in, in the state of New York, us naturopaths can't, really can't order labs. Yeah. So it, it's, I wow. really, really, I really rely a lot on the interview. And then when I look at lab work that patients bring me from their medical doctors, some things that I might see is positive Epstein-Barr virus. Um, I might see definitely a deficiency in vitamin D. Right. But that can be common. And it doesn't mean that if you have a deficiency in D, that you have chronic fatigue, but I definitely see that with a lot of people. You know, you also want to definitely look at iron levels, you know, and not, and not just iron, but you want to look at uh, ferritin, which is iron stores. Usually you might see with both chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia that ferritin stores are usually less than 50 and that there might be anemia. Now, if somebody's anemic, they're going to be tired. Right. But it appears that this is a factor that can also contribute to more than just tired from anemia, but this like other level of tired from chronic fatigue can also be associated with low iron status. Okay. And you want to look at basically any any virus that might right. shows up. Like white blood so, cell count and right. Yes, exactly. Like look at white blood cell counts, look at any virus that might show up like like herpes virus or like, you know, hep, hepatitis. Right. You no. Know? Right. You definitely want to look at those things. And um, hormones, you might also check out. That's where I was going next is hormones. What are they? Yeah. Of course, hormones are, are really tough to, <sighs> I think, get a really good hormone level on a blood work. Like, you right. know, so I don't really see hormone levels off that I, that I feel confident about often right. enough because... A blood test just isn't really a good a good way to look at hormones. You want to really look through the saliva, right? And the, you know most medical doctors aren't doing saliva tests, so I don't really get to see saliva tests often. But you know, most of the chronic fatigue patients are dealing are are in the ages of forty and fifty, and menopause often happens between age forty five and fifty five. That's so what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a relation between losing your hormones, not making as much progesterone and estrogen, and then also having to deal with chronic fatigue. Or even, you know, the first hormones to really go before estrogen is is progesterone. And progesterone is that hormone that really can help support us in getting a good night's sleep. And I also wonder if a lot of time, you know, it's like the the chicken and the egg, you know, like um 
if you can't get a good night's sleep, this could be chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. But I wonder if you not getting a good night's sleep predisposes you to chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And I think absolutely yes. And that's one of the things that happens when women go to pre-menopause or perimenopause is their sleep is now, it's more of a, it becomes more of a luxury. It's like a fleeting thing where they, you know, you lose a little progesterone and you can't seem to get that deep restful sleep that you right. once did. So if you add stress to that and you add anemia to that or even low iron status, and then you get a viral infection, that's definitely all, right. all so you, got, right. you know, to make what you need to make. Um, you know, and they say that chronic fatigue syndrome is more predominantly women, but I do have to say that my practice, I don't particularly market to just women. I mean, I think women often look for a female practitioner, but I think most naturopaths will tell you, even your male naturopaths, that like I think my practice is at least 80% women. And so there's this kind of, you know, they say that men in general don't report their symptoms to the doctor or they right. just keep going without going to the doctor. So I wonder if that plays a role into it because it definitely is men with chronic fatigue syndrome as well, but not many. Yeah, I've I was going to say because men have a they don't they don't talk to their physicians a lot. Yeah, they don't want yeah. to, they don't want to tell you what's wrong. Right, and you know me as Dr. Selassie, a doctor you can talk to. I have had the experience <laughs> where I've had some gentlemen come into my office, and they're ready. You know they they're ready to just say, "Doc, tell me what supplements to take, and I'll be out of here." I mean they're. They're not really yeah. ready for my type of medicine where I'm like, tell me about your story. Like they're more, they might be more impatient, but I could just be generalizing here. But I've definitely had that experience. I don't know where that came from. I don't, you know, because you really need to talk about stuff. Yeah. Especially when stress is one of the major causes. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Stress, you know, just getting it out can, can, right. can bring relief. And now for some general housekeeping. First things first, if you enjoyed this episode, please take a minute, go into your app and rate and review this show. Then share it with your friends. This would mean the world to me. Next up, to join my mailing list for newsletters and other emails, text RHCP, Rebel Health Coach Podcast, RHCP to 22. 828. Again, text RHCP to 22828. I promise not to send you endless emails. Believe me. Who has the time for that? Now, to grab a free 20 minute consultation with me, go to my website and on the home page, at the bottom is a red button that says Book Now. Click it and schedule your consultation with me. I will have you fill out an intake form so that during our consultation, we can discuss what I can do for you and also see if we are a good fit to work together. You can find the link in the show notes also. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the episode. Before we dive into reversing this, what nutritional deficiencies, and we talked about this a little bit, do you normally see? B, you said vitamin D, which we see a lot of. Yeah. I would definitely say vitamin D is something to look at. Right. I would also be interested in looking at vitamin B as in boy status. Okay. And interesting enough, you need B6 to make more progesterone. Right. Um, and you, what else you also need to make more progesterone is magnesium. And I would definitely say magnesium is probably one of the most common deficiencies among us humans. It's very hard to get in our, in our food supply. And, right. and Tom, that could be a whole other topic that we do together. <laughs> but um, I do think magnesium 
plays a role. And especially in fibromyalgia, um, fibromyalgia, when coupled with chronic fatigue syndrome, there's often like a real tightening of the muscles and muscles actually take more energy to relax them than it does to constrict them. And if you don't have enough magnesium, you're not going to be able to relax your, your, your muscles. And um, another interesting thing that's been associated with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia is intracranial hypertension. So too much cerebral spinal fluid Hmm. pressure in the head. And I do think that there has to be a a relationship with magnesium as well, because magnesium can help basically everything dilate your blood vessels, you know, your vessels in general, and also muscle tension and uh, headaches due to muscle tension has been relieved by magnesium. Magnesium is also responsible for at least 250 known functions in the body. So if we are not, if we're not able to run our bodies or have all the substrates necessary to run chemical processes in our bodies, I can see how that would, you know, the body's an amazing thing. If it doesn't have what it needs to run certain functions, it's going to find other ways, but that could very, very much strip your energy. But, you know, another cause of chronic fatigue syndrome, which we really didn't touch on is having some kind of mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondria for, for, you know, the rebel health listeners, mitochondria is basically the powerhouse of each one of your cells. And if you don't have, if your mitochondria are not up to par, you're not going to generate energy. So magnesium can help with that. But other nutrients are responsible for mitochondrial function, like, you know, some of the coenzymes like CoQ10, um, amino acids like L-carnitine are very important for that redox reaction. And even things that support our cell walls that help with um, the mitochondria and creating energy, things like omega-3 fatty acids and phosphatidyl things that help the cell wall. So there definitely nutritional nutrition status is, is very important. And we, we did touch on iron. And another big one, I think, is not just B6, but all the B vitamins, right. B as in boy. Um, and, and you might be hearing a lot about uh, MTHFR, which is a gene mutation that when somebody has this gene mutation and it's, and it's common, it's a common thing. I, I thought it was 26 out of a hundred, but somebody said I was wrong. So again, that's something you'll have to fact check huh. if you're listening that it's actually more than that have this gene mutation where it makes it very, very difficult to conjugate your B vitamin. Well, not difficult. You, you don't conjugate or you, you're not unable to use your B vitamins. And you need your B vitamins for so many things like detoxification and um, to help you handle depression and even things like prevent miscarriage and also for heart health that I can see that if you don't have good B status, then you're not, you're also going to be, and you have MTHFR, then that could also definitely contribute to chronic fatigue syndrome. Right. And we're talking about the big ones here. I mean, I, I think statistics on vitamin D and magnesium alone, uh, uh, they say 89%, but I see probably, I think it's closer to 92 or 94% on, on magnesium and D that we're deficient. Most people are deficient. in. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with you, Tom. I, I, I would, I think that, I think that most everyone that walks in my office could, could uh, benefit from those. I mean, we don't, most people don't see enough sun. And most people who do see the sun are afraid of the sun. They right. slather. And, and there's reason right. to be. No, right. no ozone layer. Right. You know, and like, you know, I'm here in Brooklyn, New York, and we're just too far north of the equator. And at this time, it's dark at right. 4.35 o'clock. I can tell you today that I have literally not seen the sun today at right. all. I, I probably well, was outside for five minutes and it was cloudy. And that's it. You know, right, and you add stress yeah. to that. Yeah, and then we and we, then then we go and look at the food supply that most people are eating, the standard American diet or the SAD diet. I mean, this is a 
you know, it's just, it's a, it's a snowball effect. Yeah. And talking about the sad diet, there's also sad, the seasonal affective disorder, right. you know? Yeah. Especially this no time wonder, of year. Yeah. So no wonder there's, you know, depression involved and nutrient status right. and, you know, and if we're talking about the gut, and I don't know if this is exactly an, a nu- nutrient deficiency, but friendly bacteria in the ba- gut is also really, really important for chronic fatigue syndrome because it can help you, you know, you having beneficial bacteria in your intestine is going to help you to fight viruses. Right. But, you know, our food supply, um, our meats and stuff and dairy has antibiotics. So we're constantly getting our beneficial bacteria wiped out. And then even if you're eating, you know, all organic, it, you know, there's just a lot of toxicity around that, that, that right. does not help benefit the growth of your friendly bacteria. And then the standard American diet, the SAD diet, like you said, also does not promote the growth of your beneficial bacteria because you need things like fiber to fiber and nutrition to promote the growth. Right. What kills it is basically sugar and things in the, and no fiber, right. like what we have in the standard American right. diet. Yep. So it sounds, it's, it's we're, <laughs> we're painting a dim picture here, Tom. I but I think that, <laughs> I'm trying to lighten it up. It's <laughs> <laughs> But I do think that we are, you know, somewhat predisposed to chronic fatigue syndrome. It's, it's not such a, it's not such an odd thing that, that people end up having to deal with. Right. And it's not such an odd thing that it's on the rise. Yes. Yeah. All right. So let's paint this room a little brighter. Where do we go from here? How do we treat this debilitating disease? Well, yeah, I guess that's the fun part. I mean, like, so when you're looking at chronic fatigue syndrome with all its multifactorial causes, that's that can be really great because if you kind of go through each one of the, the possible causes, then you've got your solution. Right. And often healing is also just like the cause can be multifactorial. I think healing can be multifactorial. So, you know, I, again, my approach is always, you know, what is the patient's story? And especially if it's one that has trauma or stress, getting their story out, and being able to honor some space for their story, I think is really huge. I think right. that, that that's great because a lot of times people, you know, maybe as if they're, if they, and I'm using this as example, if there's, you know, if they're in a dysfunctional situation with dysfunctional, attracting dysfunctional friends and maybe have dysfunctional family members, I'm not sure if they're really having much support, supportive people in their life that can really say, Gosh, you know, gosh, Jane, what are you going through? You know, or maybe there's more people in her life that are actually trying to bring her down or, you know, not supporting her. So sometimes I think first creating a space for that person to express themselves is really important, you know, and this is how we can actually support each other in the human community, you know, like really just take time to listen to each other. You know, no judgment, no needing to try to fix anything, but just hearing somebody out, you know, hearing them out, acknowledging what they're going through, I think sometimes is more important than providing a solution, you know, right? letting that person know that they've really been heard. So I I think that that's important. And, And for a person who, you know, I do tell people this, like, you know, if depression or grief is part of their life and, 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 or I should say depression due to grief, then I think that grief is a really tough thing for people to deal with. And people don't really deal with it. They just kind of sweep it under the rug. And I often tell my patients like, or, or I'll ask them, you know, have you grieved the loss of X or have you grieved? Have you, you know, and they'll sometimes look at me well, confused, like, oh, well, I went to the funeral or I'm kind of feeling sad right now, but have they really created a space for the, for it? You know, grieve it, grieving is not not something that you can basically demand on contact. You know, right. you can't like okay, I, 
5 p.m. tomorrow, you're going to set time to grieve. But, you know, if you even open up the space and let the person know that grief happens and grief is there and grief can be suppressed and grief has its own time and there's very many different stages, then sometimes they're able to just make room for it. And I'll have some of my patients like, um, they might go to, you know, the grave site of where their, their family member is buried. And some people might tell me that that's not where their loved one is. That's just, but I might say, well, maybe you need to have a conversation with them and maybe you can set the time or maybe it's a space. Like maybe it's a little memorial that you create, something on a side table, you know, with a picture and maybe a flower. I mean, you know, you just want to honor what these people are going through. Maybe it has nothing at all to do with grief. Maybe it has to do with things like stress at a job, you know, and they just need to blow off some steam. But you've got to, first of all, they've got to have that space and that has to be honored. Right. Um, so that's, that's the first part, you know, um, figuring out. And if you're not the health coach or naturopathic doctor or even person that can be that for that person, then help them find a resource where they can, right. you know, encourage them to find somewhere, somewhere where somewhere or somehow that they can get the, get the stress out. So that right. would be really the first thing. Um, you know, I always like to look at a patient's diet and I'm not talking about doing huge overhauls here. I think that when someone's chronic fatigue, the last thing they're going to do is gun-ho, go to the grocery store and change their diet. I mean, they're exhausted, you know? Um, but I think that what a lot of them, what you can find is a shift that, that, that can get them more um, nutrition into their body. So, you know, what could it be? Could it be adding uh, one vegetable? Could it be getting them to eat? I mean, you know, right. some people, you know, just figuring out a couple little shifts that they could make in their diet. Sometimes it's just that, you know, sometimes it could even be like, well, maybe they can't cook because they're so exhausted and they're just eating out. But maybe it's about instead of them picking up, you know, junk food from the local deli, that they actually go to a grocery store and get healthier choices, you know? You know, and it all depends. I mean, I know some people dealing with chronic fatigue and they're eating, you know, salmon and kale and quinoa three meals a day and they're, they might need something else, you know? It might be like maybe they're, they need a variety in their vegetables or maybe they actually need to do some juicing so they're having con concentrated nutrition in addition to their quinoa, salmon, and salad. Maybe it's they're having quinoa, salmon, and salad, but they have no fats, no healthy fats in their diet. Mm. You know, it's, it's just basically find, meeting that person where they're at and then finding a shift or two that you can add that you know them putting yourself in their shoes as being chronically fatigued. What could be something that they could handle? You never want to be like, well, gee, Jane, now I want you to go completely plant-based and start prepping all your food and chopping up all your vegetables mm. and no, you know what I'm saying. It doesn't Growing work real well. No. Yeah. It's it's a baby so, steps. Yeah. So finding baby steps in their diet, I think, is really huge. And and always things you can add, you know, especially like if they you look at their macronutrients. Most most of us here in this country are getting plenty of carbohydrates. Even right. if you're a very good eater, you're probably getting plenty of carbohydrates. You're probably a lot of us are either getting too much protein or not enough. Right. So, and then fats. Uh, fats, I find that most people are not getting enough good fats. Good fats. So I think even just looking at those three protein, carbs, and fats, is there a right. shift you can make there? So nutrition is always huge. And um, I always like to look at that. And, and even before diet, I mean, there's water. If somebody is dehydrated, that's going to contribute to fatigue. Right, absolutely. When you, when you drink a glass of water, you actually speed up your body's ability to create energy. Your metabolism actually speeds up. So when you're deficient, when you're dehydrated, your metabolism and your ability to create energy is just, it's not even happening. You know, mm. so... 
So that's what I love about disease, chronic fatigue. You know, there, there are little baby steps and little empowering things that people can do along the way that can help support them in, in getting better, you know? So, you know, and then there's, there's supplements. So people can actually, you know, I know some people don't love using supplements. I know that some people really like using supplements, but supplements can be a great, fantastic right. tool. I mean, maybe there's someone, they can't prep a meal, but they could take a multivitamin. Right. You know, Or you could figure out, well, hey, I think they're really deficient in magnesium and they're in pain. What, what could that do? That could give them some rapid relief. You know, like if a person is fatigued and in pain, it's really impossible to try, you know, their mindset, first of all, feeling pain is not good for, for creating a hope or trying to let somebody know that they can heal. Right. So, you know, giving someone magnesium or, you know, a multivitamin or figuring out what their deficiency might be. I mean, I'm going to tell you one thing, if they have chronic fatigue syndrome and anemia, it's going to be a long time before they really big, before right. they can really get of energy. Right. So I think iron status is huge. That's, yeah. Is there any particular magnesium you like? Well, in general, I like to use magnesium glycine and magnesium citrate. Okay. Uh, which brings me to another great topic that's very, very important with chronic fatigue syndrome is poop. Right. Because I usually give magnesium citrate, which will soften the stool if my patient isn't moving their bowels often enough. If they're not pooping once a day, right? I really like magnesium citrate for that because it's a gentle way to basically relax the bowel. It's not a laxative, right? And um, it pulls water into the colon, but yet it's still absorbable. And if they actually don't have an issue in that area, I really do like magnesium glycine. Um, like I know, you know, I know that, and I, you know, I know that magnesium three and eight has uh, an ability to really cross the blood-brain barrier. So I might use that if a patient is really dealing with anxiety or depression. In general, I don't love magnesium oxide. Right. And I, I really like, I use a lot of supplements that are isotonic in my practice. So there is a isotonic magnesium that I really like a lot. That's probably the most absorbable magnesium out there. It's actually a combination of magnesium glycine, magnesium citrate, and magnesium oxide. But I don't tend to use that if the patient needs to keep moving their bowels, you know, right. because, because being that it's very absorbable, it doesn't really end up in the colon at all. It ends up in the body, you know, which is, which is great where you want it. But if you're using it for more than one thing, I'll usually have. You know, if you're using it for right. also to help their bowels as well as correct a deficiency or using it therapeutically, then I might pick the citrate. Okay. What other? What are some of the other things that you would? I mean, well, stress. We got to work on their stress. So you work on that. Stress support, nutritional status, definitely their bowel movements. You know, because detoxification is huge. You know, uh, chronic fatigue, we didn't talk about this, but chronic fatigue can pro be caused by extreme toxicity. So, you know, definitely want to keep their organs of elimination open. So definitely helping them to move their bowels and drinking water to help them urinate. That's really important. And, you know, getting them to eat some good greens for liver to support liver detoxification. But another big thing with chronic fatigue is sleep. You know, right. sleep is where we sleep is where we basically renew and regenerate. And you're not really healing when you're washing the dishes or healing when you're, you know, shopping for food at the grocery store. You're really healing when you're sleeping. And the problem with chronic fatigue syndrome is sleep doesn't feel refreshing. Right. And if they're if they're if they're dealing with chronic fatigue. They're either sleeping all the time or lying in bed all the time, but I prefer, you know, and they're depressed. So that can be a challenge. Um, sleep can get affected by depression. And sometimes it makes people sleep too much, but sometimes it makes people not sleep. So helping them with getting rest. And then as far as fibromyalgia, if they're in pain, 
sleep is really hard to, to get, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think sleep hygiene is really important. So it telling, you know, educating them that sleep is really important and that, you know, I think people with chronic fatigue syndrome, it would be easy for them to conduct their life from bed. You know, they could, right. they could bring their computer in the bed, their phone in their bed. TV in the bring, bedroom. Yeah. Right. And then there's snacks there and they could even pay bills. And I really try to encourage people to practice good hygiene, like, you know, try to keep the bed for resting. Right. And try to take everything out of the bed so that you get more of a deep restorative sleep when you're when you're in the room, in the bedroom. And I also encourage people as much as they can, even with chronic fatigue syndrome, that they really try to, you know, sleep at night and stay awake in the day. Or not stay awake in the day, but definitely they're sleeping at night. They're not awake all night and sleeping all day. Because I think that that can that can send us into a spiral that is very very hard to get out of. You know, we're diurnal beings. We're not you know we're not rats that wake up at night. We're we're really humans that are really supposed to be active during the day. So if you're if you're in a pattern where you're sleeping all day and then you wake up at night, I don't think that that's going to promote healing. Right. So I oftentimes try to really encourage people to, I'm not saying that they have to get up in the day and go run around and, and live the life that they were dealing with before chronic fatigue syndrome, but maybe they get up and they rest on their living room couch versus sleeping all day. And then so that they're able to sleep at night, you know, if possible, I, right. I you know, I encourage that. I think that that promotes healing. If you can try to get a balanced if you can try to get in balance with the sleep cycle. Do you have um, people track their sleep? Like with a yeah, device? I, mean, I, I definitely believe in tracking. I mean, okay. I, I know for me, um, tracking is, tracking is huge. Tracking, like I, you know, with, with water drinking, I thought for years I was meeting my water requirement. I was, I drink a lot of water. So I just, I was drinking all day. So I actually just, felt like I must be getting, but when it, when I actually measured my cups, I started actually really tracking, yeah. noticed that I really wasn't meeting my requirement every day. I was more getting like 75%, which was still pretty good to me, but, but it wasn't what I, I had thought, you know, and then, you know, with exercise, when I track, I, I use a system of tracking and rewarding, which okay. keeps me motivated. You know, I'm not, I'm not very motivated if I, you know, if I can track and see that like, okay, I've done all kinds of things. Like I get a dollar every time I exercise. And then at the end of the month, if I have $20. I can buy myself, you know, I don't know, something, right. something healthy, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not choosing right. I mean, I think tracking is huge. I think that people actually don't even know what goes into their mouth until right. they really write it all out. Oh, like, that's so true. And sleeping, yeah, I don't think that necessarily people are in tune with, I went to bed at this time and I must have fallen asleep at that time. And then, you know, I'm not sure, you know, tracking really helps us to focus on it too. And, you know, what you focus on expands. So if you're like tracking your sleep, I think, and you're like, I'm going to try to get X amount of sleep. I think that you could actually Hmm. focus your way into achieving that. Right. Okay. Before we go today, is there anything else that you'd like to add to this subject? I mean, I just would love to to instill a little hope in people suffering with chronic fatigue syndrome because I think that a lot of people don't acknowledge it as a true illness. They might themselves just feel awful and right. have people thinking that they're crazy or it's all in their head. It also might feel really isolating. And I think that people with chronic fatigue syndrome can often get isolated and, you know, just would love to, to encourage people who have never heard of chronic fatigue syndrome to actually know that it is something. And if they meet someone with it, that they can acknowledge them for it or say they've heard of it. And then if you're somebody with chronic fatigue syndrome, just know that there are, there is a way out of it, you know, and it might not be a quick Quick magic bullet. It might not be one thing, right. but if you keep 
taking a step here and taking a step there, you will heal and you will get better. Okay. Now, where can they find you? I'm going to put these in the show notes, but where can people find you? So um, my website is drselassie.com and it's spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-S-E-L-A-S-S-I-E. And I offer a free 15-minute phone consultation and you can call my secretary or email me through the website to set that up. The phone number is 888-228-2126. That's 888-228-2126. And I'm here and I, you know, I'm, I'm located in Brooklyn, New York, but I do have some people that I see via video conferencing. So more phone calls. So there are ways that you can access me, even if you don't live in New York. All right. Now this question goes, I ask all my guests. One, if you, if Dr. Selassie had a half an hour to an hour to kill, what album or artist would you put on to listen to? The first one that comes to my mind who I can listen to and always hear something else is Bob Marley. Yeah. <laughs> I love Bob Marley. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah that's a good one. That's so a good one. Bob Marley. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you again. We've got all kinds of topics that we can cover. Believe me, there's plenty of them. Great. Tom, I really appreciate you. Very honored to be on the Rebel Health Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for joining in today with the Rebel Health Coach, Tom Underwood. And be sure to subscribe to the show so you can catch all the episodes. With desire and commitment, you can implement a lifestyle of wellness and fitness. For the support, encouragement, and tools you need to be successful, visit TomUnderwood.net.